let me open the defense of PhD thesis by Vladimir Karamov. Uh, let me briefly start by introducing the, the title, the advisors, and the jury, and then I will formally introduce each jury member. So the PhD thesis title is Machine Learning Enhancement of Micro CT Based Micromechanics of Composite Materials. Uh, Radmir was advised by uh, three people, two, one person at Skaltech and two people at uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan. At uh, Skaltech was advised by Professor Ivan Sergeyevich and co-advised by Professor Stefan Lohmann and Professor Jentel Swolft from uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, so the PhD defense is in program mathematics and mechanics, and uh, PhD jury members consist of uh, two co-chairs, myself, uh, Oleg Vasiliev professor, and uh, Larissa Garbatik from QLAVN, and the jury members is Professor Isana Safonov, Skaltech, Frederick Desplementer, QLAVN, and Mahu Mehtihani, uh, from QLAVN and also Christopher Hensel from University of Passau, Germany. Uh, in QLAVN, Belgium, for those who are not aware. Uh, let me briefly start by introducing, uh, briefly introducing the jury members. Uh, so the uh, more or less detailed description is on, on the board. Please read it. Uh, but uh, I will not read in detail, I just read the most important aspects of everybody's uh, kind of CV credentials. So uh, myself, Professor Vasiliev, received his master's degree at, uh, from FISTECH, Moscow Institute of, uh, of Physics and Technology in 1991. Uh, then PhD, master's degree, another master's degree in PhD from University of Notre Dame, 94 and 96 respectively. And uh, also defended his doctorate degree uh, at Caldas Institute of Applied Math uh, of Russian Academy Sciences in 2021. And uh, prior to joining Skoltech, Professor Vasiliev was uh, uh, working at different universities in the United States, including the University of Colorado and the University of Missouri. And was doing postdoctoral study at Stanford University and also did some work, uh, consulting work at SpaceX and uh, Huawei. Uh, the co jury, uh, co chair of the jury is uh, Dr. Larissa Kennadievna Garbatik. Uh, she is an uh, expert in composite materials group at QLAVN. She has PhD in mechanical engineering from Tufts University and master's degree from uh, St. Petersburg University, uh, master's degree in mechanics of uh, St. Petersburg University in Russia. Uh, her research inter interests are in mechanics of heterogeneous materials and composites. And uh, she has uh, you know, 150 articles uh, published and uh, basically, she, she works in the group of composite materials in QLAVN. And her, her current research focus is on the understanding of human nature of uh, connectedness and how it can be facilitated in small green spaces in Brussels. Uh, uh, jury member is Dr. Isana Safonov. He's an associate professor at Skoltech. Uh, professor Safonov uh, joined Skoltech in uh, 2014. Uh, between uh, 2002 and 2014, he worked in industry for uh, largest Russian company in uh, you know advanced technologies construction for composite materials, APA Tech Ltd. Uh, Professor Safonov's research interests are in polymer science, polymer technologies, mechanics, composite materials, topology optimizations, and he published over 100 uh, research papers. Yeah. Uh, professor Frederick Desplanter from QLAVN. Uh, he is professor of materials engineering uh, for the Faculty of Industrial Engineering and Sciences at QLAVN. Uh, he uh, obtained his PhD in material engineering from QLAVN in 2007. He's also head of Propolis Research Group uh, that focuses on polymer processing uh, and innovative material systems. His research interests are rheological material characterizations, material simulations, validation experiments, industrial uh, equipment for thermoplastic materials. Uh, he is a project coordinator for several European funding programs. Uh, and uh, also, uh, he is also a member of QLAVAN uh, AM, a QLAVAN Institute of Adaptive Manufacturing that brings together researchers from different disciplines to advance state of the art in, in 3D printing. 
The next jury member is uh, Christoph Hensel. He received a PhD degree in computer science from TU Wayne in the field of visualizations and analysis of industrial XCT data. Uh, he was uh, awarded habilitation uh, from TU Wayne in computer science in 2022. He is currently professor for cognitive sensor systems at the University of Passau and leading uh, the research group in for knowledge based image processing and visualization at the Fra Fraunhofer IS Development Center for the X ray technology. His country research interests cover visual analysis and visualizations of rich XCT data, research domain. Uh, he also published more than 100 papers, and uh, 30 of them were peer reviewed for books, chapters, and a patent. His research interests are focused but not limited to the following areas scientific visualizations, visual analytics, visual parameter space analysis, and many, many other interesting uh, areas related to visualization and uh, data processing. Uh, the next jury member is Mahu Mehdihani uh, from KU Laven. Uh, uh, Mahu is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Material uh, Engineering at KU Laven, Belgium. Uh, he, got, he got his bachelor's degree in material science engineering from Sharif University of Technology, Iran, in 2012, and MS degree in material engineering in polymers and composites from KU Laven, Belgium. He obtained his PhD in material engineering from KU Laven in 2018. Uh, Dr. Medihamni is interested in mechanics of hydrogenous media, fiber reinforced polymer composite. He published papers on effects of voice cracks and fiber orientations on the mechanical performances of composites. Uh, he involved both in teaching and supervising PhD students and received uh, multiple prestigious w FWO junior postdoc fellowship for his, fracture, uh, his project on fracture, toughness, and carbon fiber composites. Integrated by advanced multi scale imaging. Uh, uh, let me now, this is the jury member, and let me briefly introduce the co advisors uh, of, uh, of this PhD thesis. Uh, co advisor at Skoltech was uh, Professor Ivan Sergeyevich. Uh, he is a director uh, uh, of the Center of Materials Technology at Skoltech. And uh, he graduated from uh, Nizhny Novgorod State University with a master's degree in solid mechanics in 2000, in 2000 and then PhD in 2003. He has worked as a senior research scientist at the Dynamic Testing Laboratory Mechanics Research Institute of NNNCSU, where he conducted research on the dynamic materials properties and developed SHPB modifications. Uh, Professor Selgevich lectured courses on experimental mechanics and finite element analysis at NNSU and Moscow State University. He worked in several international research projects and been a fellow of the Civil Research and Development Foundation, CRDF at USA, uh, for basic research and high educational projects. Professor Gevich joined Skoltech in 2013 and developed research, uh, research and experimental mechanics and finite element analysis. Uh, Professor Stefan Lohmann, uh, he's co-advisor, as I mentioned before. Uh, he graduated uh, the uh, school number 30 in Leningrad in 1972. Uh, physical, physics Mechanics uh, Department of Leningrad Polytechnic Institute in 1978, and PhD in Thermal Ballistics in 1985. And then got his doctorate degree uh, habilitation on textile materials in 1995 uh, in, uh, at St. Petersburg State University of Technology and Design. Uh, since 1999, he worked at KU Laval, Belgium, and Department of Mechan Materials Engineering. He, was a, he is a coordinator of materials group uh, from uh, 2013 till 2020. He's professor emeritus since 2020 and collaborates with, with Skoltech starting 2013. His research interests are composites and textile science engineering, internal structures, manufacturing, uh, mechanical behavior, and nanocomposite, experimental damage mechanics, micro and meso level geometrical mechanical models. Uh, he teaches uh, it, 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 multiple courses at Q11, also he taught courses at Skoltech, Polytechnica Milana, uh, and Kayan. And he uh, advised and promoted more than 30 PhD students. 
Professor Yentel Sofl. Uh, he obtained his uh, PhD degree in January uh, 2015. Uh, on uh, hybridizations of self-reinforced composites for refining and modeling a novel hybrid concept. Uh, after he obtained his degree, he was at Imperial College London for one year at Marine Skodowska Curie Fellowship. Uh, back at QLN, uh, uh, he held a three-year postdoctoral position of fiber hybrid composites with high-performance polymer fibers and uh, became a research professor in 2019. Uh, he leads research uh, line micro and mesostructural design and composites and is coordinator of the composite materials group and recently received 20, uh, 20 European Society Composite Materials Award for young European researchers who have made significant contributions to the field of composite materials. And uh, now let me finally introduce the, our PhD candidate. Uh, is Radmir Karamov. Uh, he's uh, a double PhD student in mathematics and mechanics at Caltech and materials engineering at uh, He Currently, he holds uh, his master's degree in advanced manufacturing technologies from Caltech, which he earned in 2019, and bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering from NSPTU in the 2017. Uh, he has a track record of academic excellence. He received multiple awards in student Olympiads and conferences. Uh, Radmir has a practical industrial experience uh, in, uh, in some companies and completed his research internship. Uh, his research interests include micromechanics composite materials, uh, micro CT analysis, computer visions, and data driven predictions of material properties. With all that introduction of jury and committee and uh, defendants, uh, the floor goes to Radmir. Please go ahead and make your presentations for your master thesis, approximately 40 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for the introductions. And I will be uh, very grateful to present you my work today. Uh, titled Machine Learning Enhancement of Micro CT Based Micromechanics of Composite Materials. Okay, I will start with a short introduction. Um, so, uh, computer tomography allows us to acquire three dimensional images of uh, any material by acquiring a number of projections. And this projection is later is processed to have a three dimensional image of, uh, for example, here is a presented short fiber composites. Um, all the images during my presentations are three-dimensional, but uh, I usually will represent them as two-dimensional images for convenience. And these uh, three-dimensional CT images already used to uh, analyze impregnated uh, three-dimensional warp interlocks, uh, used for uh, injections analysis, and of course, of uh, using for is already using to predict uh, mechanical properties, for example, in directional composites. But this uh, imaging technique uh, have some limitations. One of them is a uh, constant uh, trade-off between specimen size and resolution. So it's not possible to have a high resolution image of a large uh, specimen. Uh, so we have to choose either it will be a large size or a high resolution. And also, the, uh, this is related for data-driven models. Uh, real data is usually not periodic, but uh, researchers are uh, favor favorable for uh, periodic boundary conditions. Um, but uh, of course, real data cannot be periodic, and it cannot be straightforward, uh, straightforwardly. Um, and uh, this. Uh, Limitations uh, can be partially solved uh, using machine learning technologies. And here on the slide, you can see a uh, number with uh, blue columns is the number of publications for each year. And the green line is the percentage of these uh, papers that mentions machine learning. And you can see how it uh, becoming more, more popular uh, over the years. Uh, this is because of the uh, uh, New frameworks, open source frameworks uh, will be av uh, already available, and also uh, hardware also uh, become more available right now. And we can see uh, examples. One of the examples of uh, how deep learning can uh, process uh, images 
present all the slides as well. And the goal of the presentation is to uh, develop machine learning based image processing methods to analyze CT images of composite materials uh, for my microstructure analysis and property predictions. And this goal is divided to following uh, ob objectives. The first objective is to develop a uh, generative uh, algorithm that will allow us to uh, generate new parts of the images. Uh, the second objective is to improve the quality of the images. It's usually called super resolution. So it improves not only the resolution, but also improves uh, other parts of the image quality as uh, contrast and uh, sharpness as well. Uh, and of course, we will need to uh, find uh, objects of interest in our CT images. For this, we will use segmentation algorithms. Um, and this, uh, all these algorithms will be validated by gener generation of periodic representative volume, vol volume elements. And uh, additionally, uh, these algorithms uh, enables automated algorithm, uh, automated identification of fiber breaks uh, using timer solved synchrotrons. Um, and I will uh, I will show you a pipeline. So basically, at the beginning, we have just uh, three-dimensional data arrays of our um, material. So it's CT images. Uh, we process them with classical uh, machine learning, learning algorithms. And after that, we are uh, able to have descriptors of our composite materials uh, to, uh, to, uh, that can be used in different models, for example, uh, fine element analysis. And do, in my uh, PhD thesis, this uh, image processing part is divided into the following parts in painting. So the generation, uh, image quality enhancement, the super resolution, and uh, object identification, the segmentation. And I will start with the data set that, uh, data set that were used in uh, my PhD studies. So the first material is, uh, composite that was scanned uh, here in Skoltech with the resolution 2.2 microns that was used for uh, impeding uh, algorithm development. Uh, also, uh, one more material is also short fiber uh, glass composites uh, that was uh, scanned in uh, K11 in two resolutions, uh, is high, in high resolution one micron per pixel and lower resolution for uh, micron per pixel. This is done to develop super resolution algorithm and also for uh, generation of periodic uh, representative volume elements. Also, uh, data sets of uh, synchrotron images of uh, misdirectional carbon fiber composites was used. So this is um, images that was scanned in, the, in very high quality. It's all point uh, three, uh, 325 micron per pixel. And also uh, the same specimen was scanned in lower resolution, also in a Swiss light source uh, synchrotron uh, in Switzerland. Not, uh, this is, was done by uh, a group of researchers uh, from K11 and other uh, universities, but I use only the data sets. Uh, and also uh, data sets of uh, also unidirectional carbon fiber composites was scanned using already time resolved um, uh, synchrotron radiation. So it's uh, data sets of materials that was under tensile testing and the materials was, material was scanned during this uh, testing with uh, low resolutions, but uh, here we have uh, a lot of fiber breaks that was uh, also discussed later. And I will start with the first algorithm in painting. So uh, why do we need in painting? Basically in painting is the term uh, that used to, for uh, removing unwanted uh, parts of the image. For example, it could be, could be beam hardening, wind artifacts, or other artifacts in the city, city data. So everything is uh, also done in three dimensions, should be done in three dimensional space. 
And uh, since it's a gener generative algorithm, it can be used for generation of new data, for example, to generate periodic uh, representative volume, volume elements. And uh, after analyzing um, conventional importing algorithms, uh, we found that they're not, uh, uh, can be uh, used for uh, generation of three-dimensional space and only deep learning allow us to do so and here we decided to, to develop a new algorithm uh, based on gener generative adversarial networks and this uh, neural network is uh, based on two uh, neural networks the generator and the discriminator so basically the purpose of generator is to uh, generate missing data and purposes of discriminator is to distinguish if the data was generated or not. And uh, here uh, we train both these both models in uh, simultaneously. Uh, and the generator wants to fool discriminator, and discriminator want to, want, wants to know why and how it was fooled. So uh, during this process, both uh, models become better and better uh, over time. And uh, yeah, generator is based, based on generator loss, uh, uh, discriminator on discriminator loss, but also we have adversarial loss that help us to uh, give the feedback of discriminator to the, to the generator during uh, this uh, adversarial process. Um, yes, and also all this, uh, Internal uh, algorithms is based on convolutional operations. Here you can see how this convolutional operation is done. So it basically uh, scans uh, all the uh, parts of the image. And here is a more detailed representation of the generator uh, architecture. So basically, what this means, it takes the initial uh, our initial image, it encodes it into the latent space and after that it decodes also using the convolutional uh, deconvolutional operation into the uh, volume with original size but without uh, our defects or without uh, with uh, all that data we want and of course it's it's done in three-dimensional space using uh, tensor tensors flow uh, framework in python um, and here you can see the results. So uh, the first column is a uh, mask. Uh, so it's input that was uh, given to the neural network. And here is the results of the already trained uh, small the neural network. It has around 4 million, 4 million parameters. And you can see how it's, uh, it reconstructed uh, fibers not so well. We have here blurred fibers and also cured fibers. So it's not uh correlate with the original images uh here you can see the in the third column the uh, results of all deeper neural network it has 63 million parameters so it's much more deeper and you can see them uh, here the results are already better and even here the neural network was able to uh, identify uh, fibers in uh, two different directions and here's the original parts. And you can see the last row. Uh, this is example of uh, how neural, net neural networks cannot uh, reproduce uh, re data. For example, here, um, data of uh, a void. Uh, and because of the, in the train training, training data set, these voids are not well represented. Uh, neural networks just uh, filled it with uh, fibers. Uh, and if we move to the metrics, so here you can see the uh, image-related metrics are better for uh, smaller neural networks. But if we move to the material-related metrics, for example, here anisotropy and orientation of fibers, we can see that uh, deeper neural networks give us much better results. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, CMN3 is more relies on the related metrics, but it, it doesn't generate new data. It just wants to make the image uh, looks as close as possible to the original one. But 
the same in fluids, it generates new data uh, that basically all the on the material properties, not on image properties. Uh, this is why I see in seven is better for prediction, but it uh, costs us uh, the number of trainable, trainable parameters, and of course. Uh, it requires much more advanced uh, hardware for this. In, for example, uh, Siemens 7 requires uh, three, oh, around 300 megabytes, but uh, Siemens 7 already six gigabytes of uh, GPU memory. So this is all for in painting. So we have here a generative algorithm uh, and we move to super resolution. And super resolution is needed to increase uh, not only the resolution of images, but to increase the quality overall of image. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, already existing two-dimensional super resolution images, uh, two-dimensional uh, algorithms, but they, they cannot be applied for our slices one by one because it will create inconsistency in our image. And this is why we need to have uh, three-dimensional uh, algorithms that uh, can work with three-dimensional space. And uh, this allow us to uh, increase the resolution when uh, it's in insufficient for eff effective analysis, uh, of course, to automate some processes, for example, uh, fiber breaks detections that will be shown later, and uh, one of possible uh, implementation is to improve the uh, overall observation, digital volume correlation, and uh, analyze the damage development. And here you can see, uh, again, I repeating about the trade-off. So we cannot have, uh, again, low, uh, high quality and large volume images. We have to compromise on something. And sometimes we cannot increase the time of the a scanning process, uh, for example, in the uh, uninterrupted in situ test. For example, here you can see interrupted in situ test in hitatone based regulation, and you can see how it affects our uh, mechanical uh, res testing results. But in interrupted, the time of scanning is much, much lower, and we cannot increase the uh, scanning time. This is why we not always can have uh, high, high quality images. And this is why we need uh, algorithm to overcome this. And of course, it's also based on uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, here we use uh, enhanced super resolution, and also we took a cycle, a cycle uh, methodology to train it on the. Uh, unpaired data. So basically, it has all uh, again the uh, super resolution generator that do, do, does all the uh, image quality enhancement. A, gener a low uh, resolution generator that allows us to train the neural network on the unpaired data, and discriminator that makes it uh, uh, train an adversarial process. And I will show you the generator in more detail. So uh, here is also uh, we have a lot of uh, convolutional operations, but it only adds uh, upsampling it the data. But uh, the main uh, reason why we use residual and residual dense blocks uh, because at each step the neural network remembers how the image looked in the beginning, and this allows us to uh, rely on the initial image at each step without generating new data without. Uh, a new data that cannot be uh, and not, not such useful in our case. And also discriminatory is uh, quite uh, classical for this type of uh, neural networks. And here, here you can see the results. Uh, so high HR is high resolution images, it's original resolution images. Uh, super resolution images you can see on the bottom and low resolution images uh, uh, on the bottom right, and you can see how well it it reconstructed the uh, from this low resolution blurry image the fibers and so on. And now we can uh, identify all the fibers individually without um, uh, much effort. And uh, also, you probably can see the texture of the 
uh, enhanced images. This texture is due to, due to the fact that we use uh, convolutional operations. And uh, in my opinion, it also can be removed uh, due to uh, using fine tuning of the model. But in our case, it's uh, already a good results and we can analyze it. And these te te textures are in fact uh, don't uh, give us uh, problems uh, later. And here you can see the results of, of uh, super resolution images of uh, unidirectional carbon fiber composites. And also you can see very good uh, results when we compare low resolution images and super resolution images, how it will reconstruct. But also we have some artifacts in the uh, place where, for example, voids, because voids are not well represented uh, in uh, training data sets, but overall the quality is very good and you really can use it for, uh, uh, for quality enhancement. And if we look to the uh, metrics, we can see that uh, image, all the metrics was, were improved and image related metrics here, and also fiber diameter as uh, uh, physical related metrics for unidirectional, unidirectional fibers. Um, and uh, the segmentation is the segmentation allow us to identify all the objects we want in our um, images and here we analyze uh, fibers so we need to find all the fibers in um, our images and here uh, in my pg uh, studies i compared uh, classical thresholding pattern identification machine learning machine learning is basically uh, allow us to pre-calculate a lot of image related uh, metrics and using these metrics identify pixel by pixel uh, segmentation and but deep learning already uh, or decides what metrics should be used on its own without our uh, interventions and if we compare the uh, results more closely here you can see the pattern identification so insect pi uh, here machine learning identification and uh, deep learning and you see you can see here how pattern identification was not uh, well uh, it's, it's good, but not uh, perfect. Uh, for example, here we have connected fibers, here not uh, well identified fibers. Uh, in machine learning, we also have uh, some limitations, uh, uh, but for uh, deep learning, it's uh, the segmentation almost perfect. All the fibers have uh, round shape without any connections and so on. And if we move to the metrics, we can see that uh, root uh, deep learning algorithm is best for uh, uh, initialated metrics, and of course, its uh, fiber diameter is much closer to the original six uh, six mi microns uh, diameter. Uh, but it co it uh, we have to train it, but the segmentation uh, time it's not as much, for example, for machine learning. So it's uh, only it requires training, but after that, it gives uh, very good results. And now I want to show you how it can be used for uh, periodic boundary structure generation. Why we, why we need uh, periodicity in uh, our representative volume elements? Here you can see the examples uh, of generated uh, periodic release, and you can see how it's uh, uh, periodic and uh, researchers in favor in these kind of uh, periodic boundary conditions, but uh, and it, it gives uh, better mechanical results. But uh, when we use uh, uh, data-driven models, uh, this uh, cannot be the case because, for example, here is our image, and we when we want want to uh, connect it each other in periodic way. We have uh, property jumps uh, and so on. It, uh, and we want to have a structure that will look like this. This is uh, my example. So we have, uh, for example, fiber here is in periodic way. It goes from one bubble to another bubble to have its periodic. And for this, uh, 
tools are used also in painting algorithm, but with, but with some uh, modifications. Uh, it also consists of generator, uh, discriminator, and additional uh, neural network. This is critique. Uh, basically, critique uh, analyzes not only the generated part, but uh, image overall uh, as uh, periodic. So it's also um, analyzes uh, the with periodic padding. Uh, and also we have uh, modification as periodic layers, periodicity loss and the resemblance loss. So it's basically uh, the idea of all these losses is quite similar. We use uh, periodic padding. So uh, to briefly uh, explain this custom layers, I will explain it on the very simple example of uh, image four by four. Uh, so here you can see how convolution works on the, um, boundaries on the boundaries it just ignores some parts of the images and it doesn't use a uh, kernel at full at size and generates uh, this kind of pitch map as a result but yeah here you can see how it ignores for example these parts as well and uh, yeah of course it's done everything in three-dimensional space and if we uh, implement periodic padding uh, we will not need to use the standard convolution operations and we will use uh, the same convolution operations, but on the boundaries it will use kernel at full its size um, without this large property jumps on the border. And here you can see the results. Uh, the first uh, image is masked volume. So the initial image that was put inside our uh, generative adversarial network. Uh, this is a generated network. Uh, here is this one, the second one. And here you can see uh, how it looks with uh, periodic padding. So it's uh, make with periodicity. So this in the purple uh, part is the image that was generated and the uh, parts on the outside, this is just copy paste from the inside of this uh, purple one. And you can see how uh, it was uh, able to generate uh, some kind of periodicity. For example, here is uh, fibers uh, moves from one direction to another direction on the border. And here, here we also see how fibers continues from one border to another border. And we can see this fiber as well. So it's, it's periodic. But the periodicity, if we compare pixel by pixel periodicity, we, here we, will, we, we haven't achieved the perfect periodicity. It was increased from 50% periodicity to 90% uh, approximately of uh, periodicity. Yeah, also these images was created, uh, we, we were able to create only small uh, periodic uh, representative volume elements because of the hardware limitations. Uh, but uh, using uh, super resolution algorithm, we were able to increase the uh, image size and laser later analyze it. Of course, uh, it has some uh, artifacts uh, due to uh, the fact that it was generated. Uh, but using uh, again uh, deep learning segmentation, we were able um, to identify uh, where our fibers, where matrix. Here you can see the probability map. Uh, so white is uh, fiber and black is matrix. And the segmentation was done in two directions to have uh, uh, averaging of the results. And uh, using these probability maps, we already um, can uh, treat it as a classical uh, CT image. And we can input it as into other, any other uh, Modeling software, for example, here, for example, uh, is model created using Voxtex. Voxtex is created in uh, K11 and also uh, in Viso. So this is a model voxel model uh, and tetrahedral model that will more smooth, but it's so much more difficult to uh, make it converge. And also here is a periodic boundary condition that was applied uh, into this model so that was uh, written in Python into Abacus, uh, Abacus Python interpreter. And here you can see the results. Here's the results of original tetrahedral model. So when we apply uh, periodic boundary conditions, our top and bottom, for example, top and bottom slices 
should look uh, quite similar, but uh, I, uh, at least ident identical. But here we have a difference that uh, doesn't have uh, physical meaning because we apply periodical boundary conditions, but we have uh, very large jumps. For example, here we have uh, low stresses, and here we have uh, larger stresses, and we have uh, property jumps that are not uh, physical. But when we move to the generated images, the uh, properties on the uh, bottom and top uh, slices are already identical and have uh, more uh, stresses that uh, looks yeah similar. And if we move to the results of simulation, we can see that uh, uh, original voxel models were able to uh, present better results uh, than uh, when we compare it to experiment, experiments. Uh, I, in my opinion, this could be uh, different reasons for this. One of the reasons that uh, using uh, real size determinations, the size of PV were, were take, uh, was taken too large to uh, have uh, periodic boundary conditions effects. And also uh, the second, the reason uh, fiber matrix properties also could be taken not uh, uh, so well. For example, if we increase the property of the matrix, it can increase both uh, results of uh, original and periodic. And in this case, periodic uh, results would be closer to the experimental one, but it uh, should have further investigations and uh, already working on it. Uh, uh, yeah, also local stress fields was analyzed. Um, yes, and the second uh, validation case for these algorithms is uh, super solution for fiber break notification when we use, uh, we don't use unpatching because we don't need it. And why do we need uh, this uh, fiber identification? Uh, because here example of uh, time resolved synchrotron uh, CT scans, and this is large scans with a lot of uh, fiber breaks in it. And, and it was scanned uh, 30 times during the mechanical testing. And to analyze it, uh, we don't have any algorithms to identify fiber breaks automatically. Uh, and manual identification can take days. So uh, colleagues from K11 will uh, analyze this, uh, this uh, CT images manually and identify all the fiber breaks. Um, and yeah, you can see how many breaks can be uh, in these kind of images. Uh, what, uh, what was done here is uh, the model from the uh, super resolution part was taken that already trained model on uh, unidirectional carbon, uh, carbon fiber composites. And it was applied to this uh, material. This is a uh, CT scan, different CT scan, uh, but uh, this CT scan was uh, uh, adjusted to look the same as the original one from the uh, tra training, training data sets. And after the super resolution, it, the data, the amount of data was increased from two gigabyte, gigabyte to 100 gigabytes. So it's uh, almost 50. Uh, 50 times larger. And here you can see the results of uh, super resolution and fiber uh, break identification. Uh, the first row you can see original low resolution images, uh, then uh, how it was increased. And uh, the last, how it was uh, objects uh, identified also using the deep learning algorithms uh, and you can see how fibers were identified quite well. And also uh, all the breaks was find, all the voids here, all, all voids were, find, uh, were found as well. And all the fiber trajectories was uh, constructed. And when we have a, fib uh, a void between these fiber breaks, we identified as a uh, fiber break. This is why we, how we found all the uh, fiber breaks inside our uh, CT images. And here you can see how it was, uh, how, um, where uh, our 
fiber breaks are located using manual identification. This is how uh, automated identification. And here you see, can you see a uh, difference? So the difference is uh, highlighted as colored um, dots. Uh, and if we compare it uh, using uh, metrics, so uh, using automated, uh, fully automated uh, algorithm, we have 82% of accuracy. But when we uh, treat uh, large objects uh, manually, so uh, automatic uh, algorithm takes less than a minute, uh, semi-automatic uh, also take up approximately one, two hour, not weeks as for fully, fully manual. And we have in the end less than uh, about about 3% of uh, missing rate. So missing rate is basically uh, the fiber break that was completely lost during this uh, identification. So it's quite good results and already can be used for uh, uh, fiber break analysis. And I will move to the conclusion. So the thesis is uh, addre addresses challenges in uh, CT image processing of composite materials uh, using uh, mostly deep learning, also machine learning. Uh, and uh, during, during my PhD studies, the following algorithm was developed is imitating and super resolution imitating for generation of uh, materials microstructure based on CT images and super resolution is uh, uh, able to improve uh, CT scans image quality. Uh, and also uh, algorithms of segmentation were analyzed to for accurate identification of uh, materials con constituents. Um, and these algorithms were verified uh, using periodic structure generation uh, that uh, the algorithms are able to help us to generate new structures, for example, uh, pe pe periodic ones, and uh, for fiber break identification to have it uh, automated, not um, find all the fiber breaks manually. And uh, I have two publications that's uh, directly related to my PhD uh, studies. It's about impeaching and super resolution. And also I have uh, more papers that was published during my studies in school tech, but not related to the directly to my PhD. And also I'm preparing uh, one more paper about the generation of periodic representative volume. So I went to uh, conduct the studies uh, to have it uh, addressed uh, more thoroughly. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I would be glad to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will start with the questions from the jury, and that will be followed by the questions from general audience, and then uh, after that we'll uh, go to deliberation. Uh, and after deliberation, you know, results will be reported, and then you know, uh, you're welcome to be back uh, to the audience, uh, to to the auditorium, and then you can actually, if you have, you can ask additional questions as well. Uh, so now uh, uh, we'll start with the jury, and we'll start with the uh, online jury, and then we'll go back to here. We'll start questions here. Well, let's start with the uh, Dr. Larissa Garbatek. Uh, Dr. Garbatek, could you start with your questions to Radmir? Yes. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. 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 Can yeah, you hear excellent. Well. Uh, well, thank you very much, Radmir, for your uh, for your work and for your uh, presentation. I have to say I've been <laughs> really impressed with the tools you have developed and uh, and for the future time you saved for you know for all those researchers who can spend now their time doing uh, creative things coming up with concept or, or doing some nice things in life instead of counting all the um, all the defects in the composite. Um, but I have to come back to some of the questions, uh, uh, one question in particular that uh, we already discussed. Uh, I find it still important uh, and maybe I formulate it in a uh, more practical way. Let's, let's imagine that I am a, uh, future user of your tools. So let's say I am a 
yeah, from the company that is producing composites or uh, designing with composites. And uh, I have heard about your tools and I find them very interesting. So because we will be doing a lot of junior, uh, 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 modeling work, let's say, with the, with the microstructure of the materials. But I'm not sure yet whether the tools are suitable and whether we should invest uh, uh, in, in these tools. So I would like to understand the efficiency part that you um, presenting in your work. You say your tools are much more efficient than uh, than the any other uh, than any other softwares that uh, uh, available uh, at the moment. Uh, and I want to believe you, but I would like to translate it in the language, let's say, understandable. Uh, to to the user. So when we talk about efficiency, and you mentioned that it takes, uh, let's say, a few minutes uh, or a few hours identify uh, fiber breaks instead of uh, of uh, months of manual work of a person. That I understand. That part uh, I am convinced about. Uh, we know that uh, your tools require training part, right? So the training yes. part and uh, this training based on the data. So you need the data. Data, we also know it's uh, you need to produce the data. So let's imagine I come to you with a composite that you have not studied. So not the carbon fiber, not the glass fiber, but let's say it's a basalt, uh, a woven composite, or it's a natural fiber composite. So can you tell me uh, right now what kind of data let's say, uh, would need to be uh, provided for the training of your tools. Um, also, maybe specifically how much time it, that will require to get the uh, to get this uh, sort of uh, data. And then uh, how much the training part itself will also take so that the user can understand practically what does it mean. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Yes, yeah, this is a very important question. Um, and um, I will start this uh, each uh, algorithm by one. So for in painting, you will need only one micro CT image. Uh, it's usually 1000 by 1000 by 1000 image. So it will be enough to train uh, in painting algorithm to generate uh, new structures. Uh, based on this uh, one micro CT. So we will take all the um, things, all the features it, uh, this micro CT consists of, and it will use, it, these features will be used to generate new structures. So one micro CT for the impating is enough. Uh, but for super resolution, uh, we will need already, uh, yeah, for impating, uh, the training time will depend, it will depend on the uh, capabilities of the hardware and it can take uh, from probably 10 hours to 24 hours to train the algorithm for generation. Uh, this is for in painting. Uh, for super resolution, we already will need two um, uh, micro CTs. So uh, basically, my uh, research I used uh, physical. Uh, Downscaling, so the downscaling was done using uh, changing uh, the parameters of CT uh, equipment, uh, but it also can be done by synthetically. So one of the future works could be related to uh, to the ways how we can use synthetic data to generate uh, to train the neural network. So we will need, uh, for of course, one high resolution image for super resolution and uh, it would be better to have low resolution image uh, made by changing uh, equipment uh, parameters um, or it could be synthetically also generated by different means for example just uh, downscaling with simple tools and also the training will depends on the hardware uh, and it, can take no more, no, no, more than 24 hours. So this is for, for the algorithm that uh, is used for uh, this study. So you can just start the training, wait for 24 hours doing something else. And after that, you will use it uh, for your purposes. And for segmentation, yeah, for segmentation, it's quite uh, uh, fast. 
for example, the algorithm uh, that I used is based on root painter software. Uh, and using this root painter software is uh, quite uh, convenient. And you will need probably uh, 20, 30 minutes to uh, label all the things you want. Well, for example, for me, it was 20, 30 minutes and no more than one hour to train everything. So after hour or more, it will be like already working too for your, your specific data. Yes, and also um, uh, I think in my, in my vision, uh, there are uh, already developing algorithms that are much, much, uh, not more advanced, but it has much more more uh, parameters. Uh, for example, visual transformers that uh, consist not only with uh, not only formula parameters, but uh, on uh, five hundred million parameters. So there are already such transformers. For these transformers, we will need much more data. For example, data of unidirectional composites, uh, of short fiber composites, basalt, uh, um, bio composites, any composites you want. We uh, give all this data to this uh, very large uh, visual transformer, uh, and uh, it probably will be able to increase the resolution of all images because it will understand how images should look like. Uh, it's already done for uh, two-dimensional uh, images uh, by other researchers. It's probably uh, two years ago already some uh, such related works exist, but two, uh, uh, two-dimensional images. So it's my vision. We will have a universal neural network that will help us without retraining everything uh, anew. So yes, I think, uh, I hope I answers your questions. Yeah, Question. indeed. So uh, it is, it is much faster than I kind of uh, expected. I mean, the uh, the the training part of the of the tools you have. Um, I have to also ask a question about periodic boundary conditions. Uh, you have dedicated part of your dissertation to uh to developing tool for periodic boundary conditions and yet you stated in the very beginning that periodicity is something that is uh, uh not existent in the material so it is a very kind of a superficial well uh, artificial not superficial but artificial feature that um, uh, we introduce in the material and you have shown some uh, stress fields and you said, okay, so if we have periodicity, the stress fields look better, even though not clear from the, what kind of perspective uh, uh, they are better. So the, the periodic boundary conditions indeed very often used to calculate like effective properties of the, of the material, um, the Young's model and things like that. But how, again, how physical it is because the that question of, having periodic boundary conditions uh, has bothered me <laughs> for a long time and people still continue why not do you just take a bigger volume of the material and then focus on the if you would like to avoid the artifacts coming from the uh, boundaries so why not to do that why do you need to introduce artificially this uh, periodicity in the material that is so random, like the one, like short fiber composite? I mean, I understand woven structure. Let's say in the woven structure, you have natural periodicity, and but in a random composite, it's convenient mathematically. It's convenient. Everything looks nice. That I can, but physically, how do you? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for your question. I understand your uh, concerns about it. Uh, this is this part was basically uh, how my PhD started. We just wanted to check uh, if the periodicity uh, allow us to give uh, better results overall. Compared to, for example, uh, using just larger uh, volumes. Um, yeah, of course, uh, larger volumes can be used, but larger volumes will 
uh, consume much more, uh, yeah, it, will, it will require much more computational times compared to period, periodic uh, boundary conditions. Um, and also, uh, sometimes it's not possible to have uh, large enough uh, RVE to make it representative. Uh, and this time, in this case, uh, we probably will need to use uh, periodic boundary conditions because we will um, we will not be able to make a larger volume because uh, we don't have these larger volumes volume uh, by any means. So it's not it will not be uh, applicable for our case to take larger volumes. In this case, we will need to use periodic boundary conditions and one of the uh, probably uh, purposes uh, understand if the periodicity in such, in, in such random uh, composites uh, is really needed to have uh, yeah, periodic boundary condition or um, Dirichlet or Neumann conditions will be enough for our case. So this is also part of the uh, methodologies. And also I, will want, I would like to expand this uh, work on periodic boundary conditions. Um, I'm already preparing a new data set uh, of uh, random fiber composites where I want to analyze, I uh, present the elements with uh, different sizes and see and which size uh, the periodic boundary conditions can uh, uh, have an effect uh, where uh, when I wasn't able to show it my previous buttons future work, it's, uh, it's much more, um, uh, yeah, it requires much more work than uh, during my thesis. Yeah, but I will I still want to do it. <laughs> okay, thank you for, for that question, or oh, for the answer to that question. Um, maybe there is also something like looking towards the future and again, um, as tools are created, mm -hmm. right, and uh, developed, and become software and you have users, uh, we start trusting the tools, right? So we kind of do wonderful things to them. Uh, they give us predictions. Um, so my question is, at which point should we stop doing that? Or do we always need to still look back at the tools and the, and and their predictions and have some checking point on uh, what they predict and if yes how would you do it here because again it's uh, the processes that we, that are involved here with the new, uh, neural networks it's non-linear mm -hmm. there is no like uh, uh you know relationships that one leads to another it's a, it's a really like a very complex um yeah co complex mechanisms that taking uh taking uh, uh taking place for predicting or let's say optimizing uh in in your case optimizing the um uh, or improving the resolution of the images so the uh how would you fully trust the tools can you fully trust these tools in the future yes, yes. as well or or yes. not or, or yeah. what should you do to to make sure that whatever they predict or whatever features they find because you pointed out that on your work you still have some uh, some artifacts that can come up right so merging fibers so let's say barely visible fibers but they are still there or or yeah or mixing a fiber with some another defect i i could imagine so how do we know that the tools are working perfectly and whether we will ever know that and what mm -hmm. are they checking yes yeah thank you for your interesting question and uh to be honest, also, I, I had these doubts in mind, and also uh, Professor Christoph uh, Heinzel also mentioned it uh, during the review of my thesis, that there is a trade-off between uh, image, uh, image, quite, quite, image of the, uh, sorry, full, 
quality images or quality of the images and the realism of these images. When we use super resolution algorithms, they will also be treated of uh, how good images look like and how real are they. So also there is a side chart trade-off. And in my opinion, this also should be analyzed uh, uh, further. Uh, at what extent should we uh, use these algorithms? So we just started to be, uh, started to uh, develop them. And of course, uh, in future, we have to find limitations at what uh, stage we should stop using them. For example, here I increased resolution from uh, in four times, but also a super resolution allow us to increase it eight times, 16 times, of course. Uh, but in 16 times, there will be uh, already no evidence that uh, the images are real. Uh, because these images in uh, 16 times already will be fully generated. And of course, we cannot trust these uh, images. But uh, in a way, we could find a way to use this already uh, not real images. For example, when we went to uh, train another method, for example, this is my thought, uh, immediate thought. Um, and we would be able to use this for training different neural networks, probably for some generation. Uh, yes, but we have to be careful about these uh, uh, algorithms that doesn't have that works as a black box for us when we cannot control them. So yeah, this is a good point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I have no further questions. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And for formality, uh, each jury need to be asked the following question. Uh, do you confirm whether you are satisfied or not with the changes introduced in the thesis after your review? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we will go with the questions uh, to the second uh, jury member, Professor Frederick Desplanter from Kyuk Lorraine. Please. Okay, so, so from my side, thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation and also the nice work. So uh, I was uh, really happy to be able to read it. So um, maybe some questions are also related to the ones uh, asked by uh, Larissa. So maybe uh, my first one is, so is it possible to provide, for example, to your algorithm which was developed to provide, for example, uh, or maybe in future, the process which is used to produce the, the typical material. So maybe you know I, I'm involved in the injection molding. Um, do you think it's, it's worthwhile to do so or, or which improvement on what can be improved by doing so? Yeah, yeah, thank you for your question. Yes, uh, uh, I already thought about this, how we can generate new uh, materials uh, that uh, didn't exist before. And uh, in my opinion, yes, it's possible. For example, when we uh, use this uh, in painting uh, generative algorithm, there is a latent space. So uh, the, basically all the features encoded uh, by the language neural network speaks uh, into this latent space. And we could take, for example, there are already similar works about it, but not uh, Composites that take two neural networks that was trained on two different images, uh, different uh, kind of images, and they take this Latin Latin space, uh, average them between two neural networks, and it uh, will produce uh, unexpected results. Uh, for example, uh, in my opinion, it could be done in the following. For example, we have material that was uh, done by injection or molding of uh, short glass fiber composites. Uh, and also we have a model of a carbon, even direction carbon fibers. And we probably somehow with different methodologies can combine two, these two neural networks and uh, force the new neural network produce uh, some combination of these two parts. Uh, of course, if we combine it uh, straightforward without thinking, just uh, uh, summing 
them up when dividing by two, it will produce uh, real unexpected results, probably a combination of two of these materials. But if we would like, if we would be able to uh, somehow decode this latent space and understand what descriptors are inside, uh, probably we'll be able to uh, identify the lo take local descriptors from one part and from the other part. And uh, using these specific descriptors, uh, generate something new that uh, didn't ex exist before and probably have some physical meaning. But yeah, it's not always the case. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I believe it's possible. And in future pub publication, probably we will see uh, new materials fully generated by uh, this uh, artificial intelligence tools, not specifically this generative adversarial networks, probably new networks will be able to do so. Yes, yeah, thank you for your question, so it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, maybe also some general questions, so you modify pictures, is it possible to, let's say, also summarize in one or another way which type of modifications has have been made. So um, instead of just having a kind of visual representation of your modification, that you also say, I changed this uh, value from this gray value to, to another one, just to judge about um, how much changes happened in the 3D file. Or... So maybe just for, let's say, a general user, which is a little bit less used to, um, let's say, all this. Uh, AI tools or, or terminology. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you for your question, but I uh, would like to clarify. For example, when we use a super resolution and we uh, modify lower resolution images to super resolution images, to higher resolution images, what changes were made? Uh, you mean this, yes? Yeah, for example, uh, that you also can judge about um, maybe changes in fiber volume fraction or or you just restrict uh, changes there or, or you keep average values or you allow some variations there or um, just to, to link it to physical meaning mm -hmm. so you can, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you, now I understand. So right now it's not possible to force neural network to change, for example, fiber volume fraction or any other physical parameters because uh, neural network just uh, learns the features from the training data set and we cannot uh, right now apply any like uh, modification to this neural network uh, because it's already encoded inside and we don't know which parameters uh, relies on this physical meaning but uh, some of them uh, could represent some physical meaning. Also, there are some works on uh, how to say uh, encoding this latent space and see what this means. And one of them are successful. For example, one uh, values are represented by edges. Uh, other parameters are represented by um, shapes. But uh, in my neural networks, it's not possible because. I, I, I'm using a lot of uh, parameters and I didn't uh, strictly say so use this in these parameters. So, but in future again, or using how artificial, artificial networks are developing right now, uh, I wouldn't be surprised it would be possible in probably 10 years from now, yes. Okay, so, and, and maybe it's also an idea just to, to compare your uh, final picture, maybe with the input picture, and, and okay, I can believe, let's say fibers can really shift over certain distances, so it's not, okay, maybe a larger volume has changed, but this is just to come up to, to do something realistic or physically possible, so what is, um, so we're not comparing, for example, fiber volume fractions beginning or, or final pictures. Yeah, we, we, if you compare uh, fiber volume fractions, it was the same for uh, for super resolution. It was the same for lower resolution images and lower resolution images, uh, with the margin of uh, two or three percent, depending on the part that I was taking for the analysis. So it's yeah, it's quite uh, the difference is really negligible uh, when we compare this. Okay. Um, so maybe I don't know if it's possible to show once more slide 34. Um, so if it's not okay, that uh, seems to be possible. Um, yeah, of course. 
34 yes 34 yeah um and maybe just without the table on it so i was just wondering at first you would think uh okay manual and and uh, automatic it looks quite similar than the third picture but uh, maybe return one more um yeah uh, one more Yes, this one, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, the difference so can be shown. So at first you would think difference is, is high. Eh? There are lots of differences displayed there. And then indeed uh, it shows that, uh, okay, if you just add uh, or continue now in the slides. Um, one more slide, yeah, is yeah. this one? Yeah, so difference, uh, it was not really clear what you mean with the, the difference now, because eh, in the table you indicate automated and manual are really close, also as uh, Larissa indicates, so a lot of automation can be used and reduce the manual work of a PhD student or other researcher. So this difference is, um, yeah, it was not really clear. So maybe explain a little bit with this difference. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah of course, I will explain this uh, in more detail. So uh, what this uh, different means, that uh, the fiber break was easily missing. So, for example, on the top slide, on the top of the image, we can see a missing fiber. If, if you compare manual and uh, automatic uh, fiber identification, uh, and also uh, when the fiber was located in different uh, in the location, that uh, is different by certain riders. If, if the fibers are located in, uh, in this, outside this radius, then I consider this as a difference. Okay. For example, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, at first you would think uh, there's lots of differences, but uh, the table explains that, uh, okay, 84% of catched uh, or something in that range is nice. So uh, maybe a, a last question. So just concerning some guidelines on uh, sample size. So I requested, or I had this question based on the, the first version of your dissertation. So you had some guidelines on, you have some things you would like to see in a picture and the size of your sample. So what's the final guideline now there? Um, so could you repeat the question? You mean uh, sample size, uh, the uh, size yeah. of the next images? Yeah, so if you have a feature of interest, for example, diameter yeah, yeah, of, of course, a fiber, uh, and so what um, size of, of your picture would you like to see yeah. or what's physical or not physical uh, what is yeah for the realistic uh, and yeah. experiments yes I, will, I have at the beginning uh, so uh, the size of uh, specimen that was scanned is yeah it's located here and you can see here for example for the first material it was uh, one and, and 1.3 millimeters, 1.3 millimeters by 4 millimeters. Uh, for a show glass fiber composite that was scanned in K11, it was 2 millimeters by 2 millimeters by 2 millimeters. Uh, but for, uh, for example, uh, in direction carbon fibers, the uh, size is much smaller because we have a smaller, uh, uh, higher resolution. And yeah, in this uh, represents the size of our images so it's all of them are really small when we compare with the uh, real material yeah um, it's in fact there is a question after the question or behind the question and so before you indicated it should be 1000 to 2000 times larger than uh, the feature of interest or, or okay maximum 1000 to 2000 times larger so you change it in the text but you change the two things so uh, it's again somewhat uh, contradictory but, yeah um, yeah I, I, yes thank you i remember your question it was in uh, a typo uh, in the thesis that i mentioned that the uh, features should be uh, yeah in, in the correct way to say it the features should be uh, one, uh, at least 1000 uh, smaller than the the size of the matrix images to identify them correctly. Yeah. Okay. So it's just okay. You, you cannot go too large samples uh, to have enough detail. Yes. So that's uh, the final. Uh, so that's uh, let's say my my major uh, questions, uh, Ramir. So thank you. Thank you for uh, the answers. The yeah, thank answers. you very much. Yes. Thank you. My question to a jury. 
Uh, are you satisfied or not with the changes introduced in the fees after your review? Yes, I, I'm happy. So lots of things changed. So just this is a small remark, but uh, okay, this is not a, yeah, I'm happy with the, the modifications. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we we'll go to the next uh, jury member, uh, Dr. Marco Bertichami. Uh, could you ask your questions? Uh, Dr. Medihani, are you there? Hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, I would like to also thank uh, Radim for uh, his work and for the nice presentation. Uh, I know that this is a lot of work to be done and is, as Larissa is mentioning, uh, uh, there are some concerns there. But this is rather a new field, and uh, Vladimir is touching upon different things in this field, which is quite impressive. Uh, uh, I have had many uh, questions, and, and uh, could you speak closer to the microphone? It's really hard to hear here in the audience. Okay, I'll try to maybe uh, increase the volume here. Just a moment. Is it better now? Hello. Something. So, could you say something so we can hear? Hello, do you hear me now? Uh, no, it's, it's actually worse. Yeah, it's worse. And now, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, very good. Yes. Okay. I've heard of what I just said, but I wanted to thank uh, Radmi once more for his impressive work. Mm -hmm. And I have had many questions uh, during the preliminary defense, which mm -hmm. uh, most of them are addressed. But still a few uh, curiosities left, which I'm going to ask now. Uh, I have uh, maybe only a few technical questions, Radmir. Uh, at some point, you talk about uh, manual annotation of your images in order to compare them with different techniques, being uh, root painter, insect, and waka. I wonder how this manual or semi-manual annotation has been performed for segmentation. Yeah, for reference, what I did, I uh, first of all, I visually took uh, the be best results uh, for our case was uh, deep learning. And after that, I was uh, changing everything uh, in the reference as I uh, think would be the best. So it's, uh, manual segmentation, but based on uh, deep learning segmentation. So I took the deep learning and manually uh, identified all the objects I wanted for high resolution images. And for low resolution images, I just downscaled uh, by the cubic interpolation into low resolution images. So basically, as a reference, I took high resolution images. And for low resolution images, I just downscaled them to the uh, the images uh, you see here. So the manual uh, segmentation was also based on deep learning. And this deep learning is which which uh, technique have you used for that? Yeah, I just used uh, images of the references. Uh, and I took uh, deep learning uh, results. And after that, I ca corrected everything that was not uh, very well done uh, in MAJ using uh, ellipse tools. So just make it more round. Uh, sometimes when this was not really well uh, segmented to make it good. So yeah, basically it was like this. Yes, but my question concerns the technique you use there for deep learning, because you, you have here, for example, in Waka, in Root Painter, in your architecture, you have all deep learning methods. So which of them was used for the manual thresholding or the manual uh, segmentation? For, for thresholding, you mean? Or for, no, the... for, for, for manual annotation, I mean. Yeah, for, yeah, for manual annotation, uh, I used yeah, basic uh, tools, uh, in image, so uh, the basically I was selecting manually all the mistakes 
that was done by deep learning. So I took deep learning and manually uh, con corrected everything that was not correctly uh, identified. Uh, okay. okay. To save some time because yeah, for if it if it will be segmented manually, it again would take uh, days okay, okay. and days. It's clear now. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question, another technical question. Is Work sex. Uh, somewhere you mentioned that the choice of these parameters was also based on the complexity of the material and the expected computational demands. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this? How these parameters were chosen uh, with this based on the complexity of the material? Uh, yeah. What the what. Did I mean here that, uh, for example, uh, in Voxtex model, a Voxel model, uh, I had to have uh, per each fiber diameter at least two better three uh, voxels representing fibers. So based on these uh, considerations, I uh, consider the parameters inside box text, such as window size, and the uh, distance between voxels uh, when the voxel model is created. Yeah, but basically uh, it is needed to have uh, enough voxels per uh, diameter, fiber diameter. Mm -hmm. So for example, if the microstructure of your material, material is more complex, how would you change the voxel parameters then? Yeah, if, if uh, the material would be more complex uh, and, for example, it would have much smaller, more uh, curved uh, fibers, I would uh, decrease the number of uh, distance, be, be, distance between voxels and uh, I would uh, re relatively decrease the window of integration uh, of a structure tensor inside uh, Voxtex, uh, uh, yeah, software. So I just would make the voxel size uh, smaller. Yes. And did you make any evaluation if the uh, parameter set that you choose is actually a suitable set of parameters? Did you evaluate this or you just yeah. trust the, the, uh, the results? Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, it's a good question. I did it in my master pages, but only for fiber orientation. So uh, for fiber orientation, I have some um, relations to what uh, size of the voxel should be. Yeah, but for uh, models, I only consider two uh, to three times uh, smaller than the size of our descriptor. In, this, in our case, it's fiber. So it's basically, um, yeah, only one case was considered. But it's good to have uh, okay. uh, analysis of uh, window sizes. Yeah. Okay. My last <clears throat> technical question: uh, In your finite element model, are you uh, considering plasticity for the matrix? No, no. I only considered uh, elastic properties, so without any plasticity. So. Uh -huh, okay. Because in the thesis, at in some part it looks like that you have used it but I, I was not sure about it oh, no 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 i haven't used uh, plasticity in okay in my now i have a few more general questions mm -hmm. uh, and i want to ask you because you have experience and uh, you have worked a lot with these tools uh, so i would like to hear your opinion uh, first of all in practical terms uh, how much tra training data do you need for super resolution? For instance, if you are uh, performing tests, uh, in situ tests with CT, with synchrotron, mm -hmm. and uh, is it enough to acquire one uh, high resolution volume before performing the loaded scans during the test for each specimen, or do you need more or less than this? Yeah, it's... Uh... Usually, it, uh, for my case, I only uh, used one volume of high resolution images, both for short fibers and unidirectional fibers. So, for both cases, the neural network was able to train quite well only one example 
So it's uh, one example, but it was divided into uh, a lot of uh, small uh, parts, uh, small cubes. Uh, for example, our initial image is 2000, 2000 by 2000 pixels. And I have divided them by 64, as I remember, uh, 64 by 64 by 64. And in this case, we have a lot of uh, smaller examples for machine learning to train on. And after that, we uh, increase the resolution of each small parts and stitch them together. So this is, uh, we uh, use one large uh, micro CT, but we divide it to train it uh, in efficient way. So one max T is quite enough for the kind of uh, super resolution uh, enhancement. Okay, thank you. Uh, these algorithms, for example, for uh, in painting the GAN and for super resolution, the ESR GAN or, or cycle GAN uh, have been developed, right? And uh, people who are working with these uh, architectures can put themselves on two sides of the spectrum, one being the user and the other being the developer, mm -hmm. right? I would like to hear where where would you put yourself on this spectrum? Um, yeah, right now I would say that I'm more, more kind of developer uh, of these tools because I mostly work how to make the architecture better and how this architecture should be trained. Um, but of course, I could use uh, this for more practical uh, purposes, such as fiber break identification. Yeah, but I myself consider more more like a developer of these tools than a user of these tools. Yeah, and I would like to continue to work uh, on this imaging technique. Uh, yeah, on this on the development of this technique, then use them. Yeah, it's my more per preference of future works so you have really uh went to, into the heart of this this let's say architectures or codes and tweak something based on on your needs right yes yes okay this brings me to next and uh, the last question uh which is about this this uh, algorithms more specifically because these uh, algorithms or architectures have been initially developed for other types of images, right? Uh, do you think that they are still uh, suitable for analysis of microstructures of composite materials? Or would you suggest uh, establishment of new algorithms uh, that, that are developed more specifically for uh, fiber reinforced composite microstructures? Yeah. Um... Yeah, thank you for these questions. It's about the future. Yes, and uh, first of all, I would like to make this uh, software not as like just a code. Right now, it doesn't have any uh, user interface or uh, interface or anything. Uh, it's quite. It would be quite difficult to use it by uh, the user that was not familiar with Python. Uh, first of all, it's good to have a user interface for this, and while the uh, user users use this uh, software, uh, we could uh, collect the feedback what they want, and uh, based on this feedback, uh, we could improve the, the the software. So, in my opinion, yes, the software is already in the conditions that could be used in the um, practical cases. Uh, yeah, but uh, due to the constant improvement of this uh, field, uh, we already can make it better because I have started it in 2019. It's already 2023, and uh, a lot of things were changed during these four years in the field of computer vision. Yeah, but we have to start with yes. something. Uh, yes, but I'm not really asking about making this. Uh, software more user friendly or, or making it easier to use i'm more as my question uh, targets more the core of these uh, algorithms you know because many of them this this uh, deep learning image processing have been initially for example developed to generate images of cats and dogs you know and and uh, working on, on on certain type of images my question is that whether uh, we can still continue 
using those algorithms and just uh, tweaking them for our needs? Or do you think that we really need to establish uh, new architectures specifically for composite materials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in my opinion, um, the, uh, the architecture should be, shouldn't be uh, specific for composite materials, but should be specific for uh, three-dimensional uh, CT images of any material. So they should, uh, for neural network, it will be no difference between is it composite or, for example, some geological parts or uh, some uh, cells from um, any other like material, uh, it will be no difference for them, uh, this architecture. But uh, what is uh, important for this is to analyze the CT data of uh, materials itself. So it should, should be, uh, the architecture should be prepared for a grayscale images uh, and should be prepared for a single dimensional case, that's all. So, uh, other other uh, parts are not no different for for the uh, neural network. It only depends on the okay. training data set. Okay, so you are more concerned with the three D nature of the algorithm rather than the algorithm itself. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks a lot, Vladimir. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Thank you. And the question to a juror. Uh, I was just trying to note with the changes introduced in the thesis after the review. Yes, I think uh, there has been sufficient changes made according to my feedback. That's good. Thank you. Uh, and we move to the next uh, jury member. And uh, it will be Professor Christoph Hensel. Please, uh, the floor is yours open for your questions. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, okay. we can hear you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I would like to start from the very uh, beginning. Um, first of all, uh, Radmir, thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> when you have a look at your CT measurements, they seem to follow all the same um, standard acquisition protocol, which maybe has been, um, I don't know, uh, um, uh, um, carried out for years and years, uh, improving um, to be um, yeah, usable and valid for your specific type of um, application. Um, <clears throat> if I would do these measurements, um, I would end up probably in very different uh, scans. Yeah? Um, so um, yeah, uh, my question would be, did you evaluate um, this, um, these uh, parameters or their influence on your results um, or uh, maybe more generally speaking, how did you determine these settings which you used to be the optimal ones? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, you mean uh, parameters of CT scanning, yes? The parameters of the CT uh, scanning device, yeah? Yeah. Uh, for the parameter CT scanning, uh, I was not uh, in charge of uh, what parameters should be chosen for each of the uh, CT scans. Uh, they were cho chosen uh, by experts in CT. So for schools, the um, for the CT scans that was done in school tech, the parameters were chosen by uh, Bohim. This is the head of laboratory of CT imaging in Hydrocarbon Recovery Center. And here was uh, for this images, uh, a PhD student uh, of K11, Tanasis, helped me to, uh, to, uh, to make the scans because I don't have uh, an access to the MaxCT scanning equipment. So, uh, yeah, and for Synchrotron, uh, it was done by uh, different uh, re researchers. Uh, one of them is uh, Christian Braid. Uh, that was done also. Uh, not by me. So uh, I, uh, in my uh, research, I only used the data that was provided to me, and unfortunately, uh, I wasn't uh, in charge of optimizing the parameters. So yes. Okay, but did you explore like um, different characteristics of these data sets, or did you just um, use 
um, I don't know, one specific data set um, throughout, the, um, throughout um, the thesis or throughout the specific subtopic. Uh, How did you approach that? Yeah, for, uh, I only uh, took part in optimizing parameters for the uh, this images. So for uh, one micron pixels, uh, Tanya Tanas has helped me to make these uh, images as good as possible. And after that, we uh, took some different uh, approaches to make the uh, uh, downscaling. So basically just move this material from the source uh, to make it uh, lower quality and uh, other parameters as i remember were not uh, changed so this is the only part where i was like uh, trying to to optimize ct scanning and for other parts there was no any uh, ct parameters optimization done and i used them as they is as they were provided to me mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> I mean, uh, I'm coming from the same domain. I also have to work with the data sets I've uh, been provided with. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to know which kind of quality um, you require by such a data set. Um, do you have uh, at, at least some guidances where you say, okay, I need um, 10 boxes per fiber, or um, is there any um, rule of thumb uh, which you can give, uh, um, like, standard users yeah who would like to apply your methods uh, in order to recreate it with uh, with their kind of data sets do you have something like that in terms of quality um determination uh, towards the scans yeah um i understand the question about the uh, how the parameters could be chosen to work with the algorithms yes how did I analyze? The, the, the question is rather what do you expect in these kind of images um, such that they work with your uh, generated techniques? What are your, um, what are your uh, requirements, um, as I said, in terms of feature size, maybe in terms of uh, um, yeah, um, specific uh, uh, image metrics? Um, is, there, is there anything how you can nail down the, the data set quality which you assume yeah uh, yeah i understand your question yeah thank you uh i think for the generation of uh for importing algorithm again there is no difference like there is no strict requirements of uh, uh what uh, feature sizes should be uh what ct parameters should be it just treats the uh ct images as uh numbers and uh, and after that it just uh, generates something similar so if the uh, images will not have uh, clear uh, fibers or something like this um, it will generate the same stuff the, the same image the same blurred image where we were not able to analyze uh, to see images clear, clearly so uh, yeah in my opinion there is no uh, strict requirements for impacting algorithms but for super resolution uh, of, of course the uh, high resolution image should be should consist uh, for uh, four times uh, better quality, not consistent, uh, it should be uh, four times better quality because upscaling done uh, usually by two, um, only by two, uh, two times. And uh, if, if you would like to increase it three times, uh, the um, architecture should be changed drama drama dramatically because it's difficult inside the arch architecture say it increase three times because it's better to work with uh, two uh, factor with the scaling with factor of two so for uh, super resolution uh, the only requirement is this yeah for other uh, algorithms i don't see any specific re requirements okay um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Maybe uh, this uh, this could be also like a, a direction of future re research um, to evaluate this uh, kind of trade-offs uh, 
of how good a scan um, has to be in order that uh, your techniques uh, um, yeah, still make sense. Mm -hmm. um, a second question from my side or a, a second topic um, is artifacts. Yeah, you know we generate uh, a lot of artifacts in XCT, um, <clears throat> especially when we have uh, high absorbing materials in the proximity of low absor uh, absorbing materials. Um, can you elaborate a little bit um, whether your um, techniques are sensitive towards um, like conventional artifacts uh, which we experience in uh, CT, uh, for example, like ring artifacts, like um, uh, beam hardening or um, even streaking artifacts? Um, did you elaborate on that or can you mm -hmm. say a couple of words on, on artifacts and uh, how they would be dealt with, uh, with your techniques? Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, I, ha I haven't analyzed how the, for example, in patching algorithms, algorithm works with removing uh, CT-related artifacts, or, for example, ring artifacts. Yeah, as I uh, understood your question correctly. Uh, I just analyzed the general case when I just remove some part of the image and want to uh, regenerate it uh, to look like it and compare it with the original uh, image case. And I believe it will be not so difficult to just uh, delete the, all the parts that uh, represent the artifacts, uh, CT based on artifacts, for example, as yes, beam hardening or uh, ring artifacts, and uh, try to regenerate this part. Uh, so yeah, it's already can be used for this kind of uh, cases, but I haven't analyzed how it would work uh, in more practical uh, ways. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> maybe a, a further a question a little bit in, into that uh, direction. In the in painting, you said, yeah, um, okay, you can use the technique uh, for reconstructing specific um, areas um, in your data sets, um, um, maybe for removing artifacts. Um, <clears throat> but um, actually, the the size of the impainted volumes, yeah, um, is here, yeah, to a certain extent, a, a critical uh, thing. What would be required in order to evaluate basically um, uh, what makes sense here? How big the representative volume elements can be? Um, which areas you can impaint, and where you say, okay, here um, the uncertainty will be um, too high. So it doesn't make sense to do some in-painting here. Uh, can you elaborate on that um, um, here at talk or what could be done in this direction? Yep, uh, thank you for your question. Yes, yeah, I understand you mean uh, what limitations of in-painting in terms of a size of the... Uh, yeah, right now is uh, uh, the, the limitation is quite... Uh, high in terms of size because of the hardware limitations. And right now it's possible only to reconstruct uh, on the uh, GPU with 16 gigabyte, gigabytes of memory, uh, only 100 by 100 by 100 uh, cube. So only this cube could be analyzed and uh, fully uh, uploaded to the GPU memory of 16 gigabytes. So yeah, this is uh, the limitation of impating, uh, specifically impating because it was developed during my PhD studies. But of course, there are already uh, GPUs that uh, have uh, 40 gigabytes of memory and more. And also there are ways to connect these uh, uh, neural networks uh, or connect this, uh, uh, GPUs into one to make more uh, GPU memory to fit a larger model inside to have to generate a larger structures. Uh, for example, this, yeah, this already uh, has has been done by NVIDIA and AMD is also moving in this direction. So uh, the only limitation, not of the software part here, but hardware part, because we cannot fit all the model, large models that can increase large uh, arrays uh, inside uh, existing GPUs. So this is... So, um, so uh, maybe you, you know that we invested quite a lot of efforts in terms of uncertainty visualization. So basically this is encoding uncertainty values um, to the um, uh, spatial values you have uh, in your data set. Yeah? 
So for example, in those areas where you don't have any uncertainty, um, you have, uh, for example, a low uncertainty value, whereas uh, in areas um, you are uh, uh, completely uncertain, you have very high um, uh, respective values. Um, would it be possible with your techniques to extract those, uh, those quantitative uncertainty values uh, in a way that uh, we could um, visualize where uh, you have a specific uncertainty value? Would, would, would that be uh, possible or what is your take on that? Yeah, uh, could you please repeat the, uh, what should, should can so, be extracted? So my, my question is, um, you can do <clears throat> an uncertainty uh, uh, encoding um, on your data. Yeah, so basically, basically to evaluate, evaluate or quantify the uncertainty prevalent in your data set. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, could you somehow derive with your methods um, the um, um, uncertainty, uncertainty which you make, for example, due to the fact that you are inpainting in your data sets? So uh, you, you're asking about, can I analyze uh, uncertain, uh, uncertainty of the generated uh, parts, yes? Yeah. Yeah. So um, right now, uh, I didn't think about it. Could I... Uh, Analyze uncertainty. Yeah, it is also related to the question of uh, Dr. Larissa Garbata about this trade-off between uh, quality of the image and realism of the image. Um, yeah, but I believe it uh, should be analyzed in the future because uh, without these uh, metrics, we uh, cannot know uh, how much uh, and, and what extent the generated uh, image should be uh, is realistic enough. Yeah, I did something similar for in painting. Uh, for in painting, I have analyzed not only image related metrics but uh, anisotropy and orientation. In this case, we can have some um, uh, insights of uh, how it's it is generated. Uh, structure is real, uh, but if we would uh, generate something larger or uh, generate something new without uh, knowing the what we want, for example, new material, yeah, it would be difficult to know is it material physical enough or real enough? Yeah, this is a good question that should be analyzed in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> another question goes into the direction of super resolution. Um, so um, from Fraunhofer side, we have now access to the uh, BM18 beamline, uh, and there we generate uh, uh, per scan something like 50 terabytes um, of data. Yeah. So when you say you want to do super resolution on this kind of um, data, which is generated uh, down there in uh, Grenoble, um, I think you really run into memory um, uh, issues. So um, is it really the way uh, to go for super resolution or um, um, did you also think of um, doing that in a hybrid way so that um, yeah, you, you said you had this, this memory constraints um, and um, for example, an analysis could be done on a sub volume of interest and not on the complete um, volume. Did you think of that direction? Yeah, um, I think uh, the future of super resolution uh, algorithms is to uh, create a new architecture, more universal one that will have much more parameters and should be trained on much more advanced uh, hardware. And uh, for example, uh, during the pre-defense, you mentioned vision transformers that much, much larger than uh, than the networks I uh, used here. And for example, using the vision transformers uh, networks and uh, to train it with uh, terabytes of data, not like uh, I hear only of only tens of gigabyte of data and in terabytes of data, it will be possible to uh, create uh, more universal, yeah, again, um, Super resolution because, in my opinion, it's it's really difficult to uh, scan uh, material in high resolution every time to have 
and retrain the model again. It's better to have some kind of universal uh, super resolution a neural network, have one uh, high resolution scan and just fine tune it to this specific material. This uh, something similar is already done for uh, this vision transformers when you can have uh, something basic, pre-trained model, and after that uh, fine tune it with new data. So uh, this is my vision how it uh, should be done in the future. Okay, <clears throat> um, and my final question goes um, towards the segmentation. We have been discussing a lot about uh, references and uh, uh, kind of ended up in the dis discussion that, um, yeah, for sure, you can use, for example, standard uh, um, techniques, uh, uh, thresholding or um, another um, machine learning technique in order to have your ground truth. Um, to get uh, a more sophisticated or, or maybe more reliable ground truth, yeah, um, it could also be advisable to um, um, just have a look at virtually uh, generated um, data sets. Mm -hmm. yeah? So um, virtually generated data sets in the sense um, that you use uh, those structures for XCT uh, simulation and um, by mimicking the real world uh, uh, scan in a virtual scan, uh, you should have a, a good guess of how the reality would, will look like um, on uh, yeah, related examples. Yeah, so for example, and, and um, the interesting thing about these um, uh, simulated uh, uh, scans is that you know the ground truth. You know each and every fibers. You know each and every diameter, and um, you have a, a very well estimate of the ground truth. Um, either you use it directly in the um, in the uh, polygonal representation, or you voxelize it. Um, did you think of that, or why did you opt against that? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your like suggestions. And yeah, this is a very good suggestions. Uh, we also uh, talked about this with my supervisor Stepan Vladimirovich to use uh, synthet synthetically generated micro CT scans to analyze uh, segmentations uh, more, more precisely. But um, yeah, it was, uh, this discussion started only in the start of this uh, year, uh, 2023. Um, and I uh, haven't uh, accessed, access and time to perform this. Yeah, but this is a very good idea to uh, make the reference of segmentation uh, much, much more precise and uh, this is a uh, more good way to analyze uh, CT, uh, generated CT data, but uh, also uh, it's good to have some analysis to real data because uh, it's not always uh, looks like the same because in generated data, fibers should be uh, ideally, ideally around, it will be cylindric, uh, yes, and for real data, it's not quite the same, always the same, and this is why um, yeah, we have decided to continue with the uh, real data, not the synthetic, the synthetic one. Yeah. yeah, yeah thank you. you. I know yeah. the field is very wide. You can continue your research in any direction. If you need a CT simulator, you're most welcome to, to contact yes. us. So thank you very much, no more questions. Thank you, thank you very much for your comments and suggestions. Final question to a jury member. Are you satisfied or not with the changes introduced into the thesis after your review? Yes, I yeah. am. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, person who will be asking question is Professor Alexander Safonov from Skaltech. Okay, and... Uh, um, uh, Radmir is a very hard working student. So I see that you are working in our open space uh, a lot of time. So uh, each day I see you in our open space and you are doing a lot of job. So, uh, and you did very good, I mean, PhD thesis, but for me, Actually, it's hard to read because I see that in this thesis, is at least we have uh, three topics for the PhD thesis. One is chapter five, it's just in the machine learning based image processing of micro CT images. That's it. 
and uh, maybe you just uh, analyze some of uh, algorithm about uh, processing of micro CT. And it's just computer science project, computer science PhD thesis. Another one is uh, finite element micro CT based modeling of composites based on this uh, enhancement of micro CT images. And maybe another topic is about uh, fiber break identification based on your super resolution enhancement and so on. So, uh, and I recommend in the future, I just sum summarizing that we uh, already discussed, just to dig deeper in research in each this topic. It's look like this for habilitation, you know, so, and uh, uh, for, for me, actually. And um, the question, first question for you, what was the main topic of your research? Just one sentence, maybe two. Yeah, um, thank you for your comments. Yes, uh, I have already thought about it. Uh, and about the meaning of my PhD thesis, yeah, I would say uh, it's basically the title. <laughs> uh, it's uh, machine learning enhancement of uh, CT-based micromechanics of composite materials. And I can elaborate about it a little bit. Uh, so uh, main purpose of the, like, at this shape, at, right, at the shape that my thesis right now, it's basically uh, how, how deep learning algorithm, machine and deep learning algorithms can be used for uh, enhancement, enhancement of image-based simulation of composite materials. So here I show the ways of uh, how deep learning can be used uh, to prepare uh, better, um, not better, enhanced uh, representative volume elements for future uh, models. Not only, uh, are we, this is really about chapter of six. Uh, yeah, and also uh, for uh, other models, for example, for uh, fiber breaks and identification. So, this is basically how machine learning can be used for our field, in our field, in field of composite materials. So, yeah, maybe for the future, but we already discussed it months ago, or maybe two yeah. months ago in the kitchen. Yes, so yes, I remember. PhD thesis is, is about the solving of the problem. For me, yes. What problem? you solved a particular problem. Uh, here uh, I have one new specific, problem, a specific scientific prob problem, specific uh, problem that uh, fiber, yeah, for example, fiber breaks. Uh, right now, they are analyzed only manually for time resource synchrotron regulation. And it give us very, uh, a specific uh, limitation of uh, human hours to analyze a lot of uh, these CT images and without automatic algorithm, the research in this uh, direction can take a lot more, uh, more time uh, than with automatic algorithms. So uh, it, this, uh, this uh, part solves the problem of uh, processing CT images of unidirectional carbon fiber composites with uh, fiber breaks. So, yeah. oh, okay, it's a good. So, good luck yeah. to solving that problem. So, uh, in the future, and of course, some of this problem you already solved. And like we discussed, for example, in the finite element CT, I mean, the generation of RVE, yes. maybe with your algorithm, you can uh, generate your RVE with high volume fraction, maybe for random orientation. Yes, yeah. 
for uh, also for uh, thank you for your mentioning this. Uh, one of the problems that was uh, not solved uh, before, but is the generation of, of fiber uh, short fiber composites with a high volume fraction uh synthetically so it's very difficult to uh, create an algorithm of uh, uh, that is able to put all the fibers together in very close package with the curvature and uh, so on uh, synthetically but with image-based simulation it's possible to uh, yeah it's possible to create first of all this material and after that, a scan with MicroCT and already using MicroCT create this uh, model with high uh, high fiber volume fraction and analyze it. Yeah, for example, as here we analyzed, should we use uh, periodic boundary conditions or not? Uh, started to analyze, and of course, I will continue. I want to uh, continue to work on it. Yeah, I, in the future. Yeah, I recommend to continue and make a good publication about that. Yeah, thank you. And like in a first, I mean, in machine learning based image processing, I recommend you to make a evaluation of your algorithm based on benchmarks. That's yep. maybe some benchmarks used on that and analyze the efficiency of your algorithm because it's not mentioned with comparison with other algorithms. Yeah, yeah, thank you. This is a good point. And uh, of course, I will. Uh... I add it into the future publication to make it more like uh, oh. expanded and more, 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 more precise. Okay, thank you. That's it. For me. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I have to ask a question. Uh, would you remember, are you satisfied uh, or not with the changes introduced in the thesis after the review? Yes, I satisfied. Thank you. Okay, so the last uh, member of jury is me. Uh, let me ask a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, could you put the slide when we had this result around slide 20 or 22, I forgot, where you have three three uh, pictures of the your results of three like uh, identification uh, circles. Uh, no, it's like, segmentation, yes. Yeah, uh -huh. I forgot what was this. Yeah, this uh, we just passed. Stop, yeah. Okay, uh, the question which I have is the following. It's a little philosophical plus uh, also scientifically oriented. Uh, I understand what you did uh, with the classification of using uh, machine learning is you did on the pixel levels. It's okay, especially when you go find that element again on the pixel level. Mm -hmm. uh, what if I ask myself a question? Uh, I have, a, let's say, some fibers. Mm -hmm. let's, at this point, let's just analyze these images. Assuming, I assume that my uh, fibers are perfectly cylindrical and kind of banded. Then when I cut across them, what I have, I have a circles and ellipsoids. And if, if I put a restriction on that, and assume let's say all fibers of the same radius, or even give some variation in the radius, all of a sudden I reduce dimensionality of my problem to drastically, you know, from your thousand by thousand, uh, you know, pixels to, I don't know, few hundred, few thousand. And uh, it is well known in machine learning that if you project to no dimensional space, which is good approximation, what you're looking for, the cost of approximation and you know and the accuracy is growing very fast. Uh, so, in this sense, uh, uh, what was uh, motivation, uh, you know, to start with this uh, pixel level machine learning, rather than not to reduce to the parametric model? For example, here. Uh, my unknown would be, let's say, simple example, let's say, I assume all the radiuses are the same, yeah? So the, the unknown in the problem would be a uh, number of, of these fibers and their locations. And that would be a very small problem. I don't even need to include machine learning. I can do simple, uh, you know, least square problem and solve it. All the machine learning doesn't matter. But it will be much faster. Uh, what do you gain by going to the pixel level compared to the parameterization uh, level and optimizing this parametric problem? Um, thank you for uh, your question. Yes, so it's important question, and it's also kind of related to the question uh, of Professor Safonov. Um, here's yes, this is quite a simple example. This is uni unidirectional fibers, and for unidirectional fibers, it's quite easy to have just the location and. Uh, 
if we, for example, here can conclude the center of the each fiber. After that, we can apply the parameters, so for example, diameter and so on. And it will be easier to generate uh, any structure, any like uh, fiber volume that we want here parametrically. But uh, with short fiber composites, yeah, I will show it. Yeah, for example, here uh, in these examples, this is much more uh, difficult examples because um, here it will be not as easy to uh, uh, say uh, to create such uh, algorithm that will create our parametric model with uh, all the fibers uh, that located as close to each other as in real life that produce a high fiber volume fraction. For example, with the existing algorithm, uh, for example, random uh, absorption alg algorithm, uh, there is algorithm, it's possible to achieve only 30% of, uh, approximately 30% of volume fraction of short fiber composites. But in reality, it's possible to have uh, 40, even 50% in, uh, because, because the fibers will condense to each other very closely and they will be uh, curved around each other. And it's very difficult to uh, make it uh, using parametric models. And this is why uh, there is a development of image-based simulation where we take the image of uh, our material and uh, find our objects. And after that, uh, using these ob objects, we uh, create our models. And also, of course, we can uh, do something in between. We can take this data, uh, for example, uh, find all the trajectories of the, our fibers and that after that, say, say to the algorithm, uh, make uh, the fibers with these trajectories, with this specific uh, uh, fiber diameter. Yes, uh, it's also possible, but uh, and it will be very good with uh, less parameters, for example, with then compared to pixel based. It's also will be parameter parametric, but again, without image images and without this kind of segmentation, these models would, wouldn't be possible because there is no such generative algorithm. I'm not talking about models of material. I'm talking about models of the fibers and it's a very different story. For example, mm -hmm. the model of the fiber, you can say uh, radius, variation of the radius, and let's say 50 points to basically do the central line of the fiber. And a number of the fibers could be known and placement of these models, it's not algorithmically. You can place them as machine learning. What I'm as telling you is a different story. I'm saying you're looking in different space, projection space. Your cost function is not pixel level based. I mean, it should be pixel level based, but in, based on the model, which you low dimensional model. And that's, that's just basically, it's, I mean, you can still use machine learning for that, anything like that, uh, uh, but where you start from, what you did is pixel level. That is completely fine. I'm talking about uh, uh, projecting on the uh, fiber level and optimizing fiber level model. And then you can do filling all these things. I mean, people do it in uh, other, uh, other things. And we can talk about later, but it's just a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. The second question, I, I just also curious a question. You talk about super resolution. Uh, so we said we do binary upsample by factor of two. Have you tried for curiosity if you get your original image, apply super resolution to that, then take this super resolution, apply another super resolution, and continue on? At what point it will situate and, you know, and the quality will go bad compared you know, to your you know. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Yes, I have tried something similar. Uh, for example, here you can see that uh, upsampling is done only yeah, here uh, twi twice. So it's by two and by two. So we, I have here upsampling is by factor of four. Uh, and it is trained on this kind of upsampling. So for example, I take, uh, yeah, in this algorithm, I take low resolution cube, three, 33 pixels by 33 pixels by 30, 30, uh, 32. And I'm sampling to the size of 128 pixels. So this is how the uh, model was trained. And if, we, if I apply 
apply it's, uh, it again, it will not produce good results because it remembers uh, how image should look like in the lower resolution. Yeah, here, for example, yes, this is example of short uh, uh, glass fiber composite. It just remembers that this is, for example, edge, uh, and this edge should be precise. So it should be uh, not should be such blue, and it will reconstruct it as this. But if I apply the same uh, super resolution algorithm already on this image, it will not find these uh, features that uh, it was get used to during training on lower resolution images, and it will produce really unexpected results, and it will not work. So I have tried it, and it's basically a bad idea. To make it uh, one uh, step further, it's, uh, it requires to have uh, another training and another like uh, data set uh, to do so. So this is why we discuss this universal uh, very large uh, model with fine tuning to make it possible because right now at this stage it's uh, yeah it's limited to only one uh, factor of upscaling. So that's exactly now basically I'm going back to the circle of the first question. That's exactly what, what my point is. By limiting yourself to doing pixel level, mm -hmm. you are limiting yourself to the noisy data. You're limiting yourself to many things which is you know noisy from the signal or what you mentioned. So basically, cannot increase your resolution. Yes, yes. If you do projection-based optimization or projection-based machine learning, when you project to the to the space in the parametric space, it could be large. It doesn't matter. From that point on, I can have resolution. I will have exact data. I could have any resolution I want. I mean, I can do finite element and you know go to any precision I want. I will ha I will have it. So so that's a kind of uh, plus beauty. Uh, it is more difficult. Uh, because it involves topological kind of a little bit optimization, uh, but uh, it opens horizons to much uh, higher quality results. Just think about it in the future. So I think that's it for my questions. Yeah, and thank so, you very much for your questions. Yeah, it's uh, really helpful. Uh, and uh, so I'm mean, going to ask myself if I'm satisfied or not to the changes, and I say yes, I'm satisfied. And with that, uh, we move to the next uh, phase of our PhD defense. If you're going to the, uh, uh, we need to ask a general audience if whoever is left uh, in Zoom in here. Do you have any questions you want to ask? Oh, no question? Or we, yeah, you can consider yourself a general audience. <laughs> Advisors also can ask questions as well. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, so no questions from, any question from the Zoom audience? Okay, so then this phase was quick. We move to the next phase. We will ask, uh, we go to the jury deliberation and we ask the general audience to leave step for short time outside. Don't leave. Yes, and don't leave. There is some, is there a coffee place? Yes, yeah, so we can have some coffee. Don't go far away and we will, we will deliberate for a short period and then you can come back. Pardon me, supervisors. Yes, yes. So they'll say if you have uh, this, uh, ask questions, supervisors want to ask questions. Or, or I mean, if you provide comments, uh, you want to clarify some questions which were asked from the audience, do you? Because, I mean, you later can give general comments uh, about. Uh, no, 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 no. We have to watch what super. No, we have a special, uh, no, yes, supervisors, yeah. So sorry, I, I changed the protocol. The, now supervisors, we have to basically give the talk to supervisors, yeah? They need to talk. Yes, about yes, stuff. yes. Not just if, questions. if they have any supporting words, not maybe questions to Radmir, this so, is a very good time to, yes. to do so. So, I mean, Be before we start the questions, you don't know your comments about uh, the candidate, about your you know, experience, anything you want to add, uh, uh, so, okay, let's start with Professor Lomov. Uh, yeah, to start, to start with this, um, I was very happy to work with Radmir all these years. Uh, what I wanted to say is that Radmir started with us in Leuven even a, a year before getting the, as a master student. And at that time, he produced very interesting results which were published in composite structures. 
And this is a paper which has been cited about 50 times, which means this paper which has been used by every fifth researcher working in the field of fiber orientation in, in composite materials, which I think very, very good sign. And what happened afterwards in PhD research, this was yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I just uh, uh, like to say a couple of general words about uh, this uh, research. So uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that uh, here is uh, you see the very good example how to overcome uh, the main challenges in uh, analysis of composite materials and what uh, because of real uh, simulation tools. Uh, 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 have been developed uh, in this work. And uh, frankly speaking, we can say that now uh, we are getting closer uh, to solution of problem of microstructural uh, evaluation of composite materials. And uh, here we have a very good example of uh, multi-step uh, research where are you uh, immediately come uh, to uh, high uh, resolution and uh, data-driven uh, representative volume element that actually give us ability to uh, analyze material structure uh, regardless uh, uh, what actually we have uh, as an input data uh, applicable uh, for uh, randomly reinforced uh, composite and the uh, unitary role. So therefore, I can say that uh, now we have very good results. And uh, I, I guess uh, it's from my point of view, uh, one of the best examples of uh, PhD uh, statuses devoted into uh, microstructural analysis and evaluation of composite materials. So thank you very much. Much, thank you. Uh, and then uh, uh, the third supervisor of uh, Redmir was uh, Professor Jens as well. Are you there? Are you online? Yes, I am. Could you give some comments? <laughs> if yes. you wish, of course. So, I, I agree with the comments of the two other supervisors. Uh, that was very easy to work with. But maybe the thing I want to highlight a little bit that compared to most other PhD theses, a lot of the ideas actually did not come from the supervisors, but from Radmir himself. Um, the, the idea to work on super resolution, in painting, these were all things that he brought to us and that we provided input on the details, but the, the basic idea actually came from him, which is a bit unusual, I would say. It's not the way it usually works, and that just, just highlights his, his independence and his creative thinking. That's, that's all I wanted to add to what I was already said before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antal. Thank you. Thank you. So now we should we ask advisors as well to leave or they can stay? Uh, okay, then we just ask a, a general audience to leave for a short period while we discuss, deliberate on the defense, and then we will, you will be invited back. Don't go away. <laughs> Don't go far. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to announce that Radmir Karimov basically passed successfully <laughs> without as is your thesis congratulations to the doctorate family at Caltech and thank you very much thank you and now uh, you know before uh, you know i give the floor to admir for kind of conclusion and thank you for your answers do you also want to go back to advisors and now tell some kind of formal informal experience, I don't know, jokes, anything you want. Congratulations uh, to Admir. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a uh, uh, good uh, assessment uh, of our joint work. Uh, and first of all, uh, I want to say thank you very much uh, to our colleagues uh, from uh, Catholic University of Leuven, uh, who uh, supported uh, this uh, research during uh, uh, four years. Uh, and uh, now we, uh, we have very close collaboration uh, with uh, uh, Catholic University of Leuven for a long time. Uh, and uh, also I'd like to say uh, thank you very much to uh, jury members, 
for uh, scrutinizing of the research results uh, and uh, comprehensive discussion and uh, clarification of all uh, data or results uh, that was uh, demonstrated presented today uh, and it's actually my great pleasure to be uh, uh, a part of uh, this uh, research group uh, and to be supervisor of Radmir Karamov. Uh, so let me say uh, once again, thank you very much to all of us for support of this uh, job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, from, from my side, uh, I would like to second the thanks you very much for, for, from, uh, from Professor Sergeyev and the collaboration with Skaltech was very fruitful in this uh, work and another pieces of work which we which we have done. Um, I also wanted to add uh, something philosophical, as was mentioned. And if you, to do this, I tell you the historic anecdote, if you like. Uh, you know, in there was an uh, algebraic school in Moscow of Nikolai Luzin and his colleague. You may know, you may know his name. He is very important algebraist of the uh, 20th, 20th century. And he had a very strong group in Moscow. And this was in beginning of 20th century. And one of his uh, colleagues, uh, Minshov, also important algebraist, he left um, memoirs about that. In this memoirs, he was he said he said the following: Year 1917, mind the year, year 1917 was very important for us because in this year we started studying trigonometric series. Full stop. So the comment which I would like to make to to make that uh, I wish very much Radmir that. In this year of war and death and shame and devastation, you will remember it as a year when you made important progress in super resolution. So with this, I can congratulate you with your work and hope to very happy returns of these collaborations with you and your colleagues in Skaltech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the word goes to Professor Jan Fotsov. Please, could you give some comments? Yes, I would mainly just like to congratulate Radmir. It was an absolute pleasure to work with him. Um, and also thanking Skoltek for allowing us to have this joint PhD, which I think was very fruitful. And it was great to have Radmir working on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jantel. Now the word is uh, to our new defendant <laughs> person, please, defendant person, Radmir Karimov. Please uh, say your final notes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, being here, for supporting me. And first of all, I would like to thank you, my supervisors, uh, Professor Stepan Lomov, or Professor Ivan Sergeyev, and Professor Yantel Wolves, for uh, your support during these four years. Uh, without you, um, the dissertation would not be possible. Uh, you have shaped uh, not only the content of the uh, paper, but my attitude to the scientific world and me as a person. Also, I'd like to thank you, uh, my PhD colleagues for their camaraderie and support. And uh, most of all, I would like to thank you, um, my family, my mother, uh, father, and uh, brother Tagir, who is right now here. And also, I'd like to thank you, Arina, for her support uh, during most most difficult, most important parts during my PhD. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you very much.